I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I can't hear you, Ashin. <laughs> uh, hey, Goldman. Yes. How are you, mate? I think I've now got you. I'm good. Thank you. Fabulous. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we were just finishing up a, a real quick kind of break, uh, like a kind of changeover between our, our special guests this evening. No um, so uh, where are you ca calling in from this evening? From London, from my place in Seven Sisters in North London. Seven Sisters, yeah, right. I know it well. I, I used to live in uh, near Finsbury Park. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, used to travel through Seven Sisters a lot. Uh, some good gigs up in Finsbury Park via Manor House and Seven Sisters. There you go. There's a few places and, about. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so let me just, I'll just have a quick look and see how, yeah, it looks like everyone's back. We just had a real quick sort of comfort break. So, um, okay. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there's a little chat window and people are already saying hello to you in there. You're very welcome to join us in the chat window. I um, don't see that at the moment. Can I? Oh, ah. no, got it. Right. OK. OK. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, my screen. So it, this is sort of uh, this means that you can start sharing yours. OK. And um, yeah. if you have a webcam, you're very welcome to switch it on. Is it not? I thought it was on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Honestly. It's um, Microsoft Teams and me. It's, it's sort of a running joke. There you are, man. Hey, fantastic. Brilliant. Can you see me okay? Absolutely. <laughs> Looking good, man. You got oh, thank the you. guitar on the, on, yeah, it's Goldman's like, um, <laughs> is a phenomenal musician, uh, solo artist, uh, you know, record deals, the work. So, uh, but, you know, interesting path into the world of UX as well. But Which nice to see the fun. guitar. On the, on the <laughs> exactly. Back, it's a beautiful one there. as well. It needs a polish, but it's, it's, oh. in, it's a good one. It's a sweet guitar, man. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Irene says sleek guitar. It's a, it's a high praise. OK, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, well, I've got a lot to get through um, and I'm going to probably fire ahead. Um, excuse me, Oshin, can you keep talking if I have any troubles with sharing my screen? 100%. I'm going to try and do a share on this right now, kick off my presentation. And then how do I now switch on the other thing? Blimey, here we go. Right, okay, so if I, where's my takeover? Share desktop. Okay, I'm gonna try that. Open system preferences. Of course, Mac hasn't used this before. <laughs> so I now have to go in. I may even have to restart the app. To uh, get no worries. I think it's, there's like a, a share button within Teams that gives you some options and you can share your desktop or PowerPoint or your PDF or blah, blah, blah. That's it. I'm going to come straight back in because um, the security preferences, I have to restart the app to give Teams okay. permission. I'll be back in a moment. You do your thing. OK, all good. Uh, so, folks, do um, uh, I mean, Goldman's going to probably share quite a bit of good information. Uh, if you have any questions, do make a note as uh, as he's going along. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll get some links to his music as well. It's really, really good. So, so we're now getting a an indication of how long it takes to restart Teams or or possibly restart the laptop. Um, any questions or observations? Uh, any more information about anything that we've done today? Okay, on my back. Ah, here we are. Go open. Perfect. Okay. That was quick. All right. Yeah, I just needed a restart once I changed security permissions. I'm going to okay. try and fire ahead. I had some timings written out, but we're already four minutes into them. So. Uh, it's all good, my friend. All good. <laughs> I'll steal some time. Okay, let me know if you have any trouble. I probably won't be able to see you guys while I'm talking through this press, but um, see how we go. Okay, so what am I looking to share? This one, uh, screen two. Yeah, that should do. Okay. I know what second from this. That's Are you absolutely saying? perfect, Goldman. We can see it now. Okay. Brilliant. I hit present. That's the next test. Perfect. That's it. Still see it? Perfect. Excellent. There we go. Good stuff. Okay. So UX and service design as a career. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I love doing stuff like this. I've just spent um, three or four months teaching at the at WeWorks Flatiron School, um, teaching three different groups of um, three different cohorts because it's an Amer American organization. Um, UX and UI. 
Um, they've all graduated and they all got back to work before I did, uh, interesting enough, when I changed, um, which you'll find as you get more senior in this role, the, 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 the problem becomes finding the right role, not necessarily um, a role. So here we go. So you, you're probably thinking, who is this guy? So I'm Goldman. Um, I'm a UX and service designer, consultant, architect, analyst, experience architect, user experience champion, CX architect, etc. I kind of I draw attention to this because I've worked under so many different job titles over the years. Um, they're generally defined by other people rather than me. I don't really care what they call me. I've done a variety of things over the years under different names, but it's all largely a collection of different things. Sorry, my cat is going mental beside me. Cat, come on, what do you want? You might just want to go outside. Bear, bear with me one second. I'm just going to exactly the same, <laughs> same issue made, no problem. <laughs> All right, one second. Sorry. Uh, cats are a big running feature of this uh, UX driven business uh, since the lockdown. I'm very happy to say. There you go. I am now on my way back. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, my cat has been doing this for weeks. Don't worry, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Is he meowing at me? In the, he's beside me going, meow, meow. <laughs> anyway, so here we go. Yeah, they will call you many different things. I don't really mind. Moving on. Okay, sure. So what have you done? Um, so kind of give you an idea of the sort of stuff I've done over the years. This is kind of a visual representation of my CV in logo form. This is quite nice. I chuck this in my CV and portfolio, or certainly in the portfolio. Um, clients tend to love brand names and they love brand logos and they love to look at stuff very visually. So if you can see all the way back in the darkest days, Ashin might remember East Coast FM, 103 FM in Ireland back in oh, the yeah. back in the day. And I kind of worked through originally kind of um, I won't talk you through all of it, but I've kind of gone from originally kind of music media sort of background forward into this kind of thing. So got you. How did you get there? And the subtext for you guys, I'd imagine you're asking, how do I get there? Because you're paying for this course, presumably, and you want to know whether it's going to be worthwhile. So my career path, and it's very different for everyone. I was in when I kind of originally got out of media and entertainment, um, I found myself being quite good at computers, knowing a fair bit about it. I was the guy that other people came to me, came to for help. I was helping bands I knew. Um, in fact, let me start at the beginning. I, I bought myself a computer after having started as a child being involved in computers and then losing it for a little while. Um, I bought a computer to, to hook up to some MIDI equipment for my own purposes. Realized I didn't know how they worked, had no one to pay to fix them for me. So I learned to do it. So then kind of became the guy that everyone came to with their questions and I ended up helping bands I knew um, put music equipment into their studios and stuff like that. Um, then suddenly I needed a new job. Um, music business wasn't a quick option. So I ended up with a tech support job at a company called CompuServe, which you might remember if you're old enough. Um, there was CompuServe, AOL and Netscape. We had three big brands um, AOL was swallowing everything back in those days. And I was doing tech support for CompuServe went on to do support for AOL and then later for Netscape on Netscape and Netscape online. Um, so from there, I they gave us a they advertised for a secret job, which I thought was going to be training other tech support reps, but it was actually launching a new ISP. Um, this was called Netscape online. It was to fight something called FreeServe, which was going free, changing the business model, really disrupting the business model in the UK um, of how people paid for the Internet. At the time, people were paying 20 quid a month to connect to AOL. And then these services came along where you just paid the, the price of the dial up phone call. So I ended up working on that. Now, apparently, I put so much time in, and this is a key thing. I put in a lot of free time and free effort and showed a lot of enthusiasm. And as a result, at some point or another, they invited me to come up and, um, and apply for a job as product manager for this new ISP. I'd literally just been a, a phone rep answering the phone for, you know, six, eight pounds an hour, that sort of thing. And um, they had a product man management job going. They offered it. Um, I went up and applied for it. I had a child on the way who's now 20. <laughs> and I remember sitting on the bus with the bus fare I'd had to borrow to get up there and thinking, I've got to get this job for Dylan, who is the name of my youngest son, as I say, now 20 and in film school in Manchester. And um, I went up there and the 
call center guys laughed at me, said no one ever got a job in head office for the call center. But I put the effort in. I pleaded with passion over the user. And I think this is really important in my background. I listened all day long to people calling up and complaining about what was wrong with the service. And I saw product managers coming up from London telling me, hey, we're launching a new um, stock ticker for the service. And I'd be the mouthy one at the back saying, uh, what are you launching that for? I've got people that can't connect and get their email in the evening. OK, and eventually I think they said, if you're so clever, you come and fix it. So I got the I got the um, product management job. So I ended up as a product manager all of a sudden. I had no idea what that was. Um, I had to buy books. I had to ask people. People took me under their wing. Um, someone once told me when I was very junior at this, I said, how do I get people to listen to me? How do I get ahead in this kind of thing? How do I get to a position where I can actually do stuff about things? And they said, you need a mafia. Or in, in Ireland, we call that a mafia. I think I actually might remember. But um, we would go ahead and I, I would look at who can I get support from? Who thinks the same way that I can? And I got people to help me and explain things to me clearly. Thankfully, I had a really, really supportive boss, um, a guy called Sean Johnson, who really gave me a chance and an opportunity and said, you, you just go out there and tell people what you want. I'll back you up. So I used to walk into these meetings. It was all an alien world to me. I didn't really speak business language. I'd worked once as a, an A&R guy in New York where we got up at midday and came in and put our feet on the table and listened to tapes. <laughs> you know, it wasn't really a kind of office background. I remember laughing and being hysterical in my first meeting, just not really being able to believe the phrases that these people were using, this kind of business bit buzzword bingo thing that I really wasn't familiar with. Um, but over time, I made my way. And what really helped was I would go in and say to people, you know, I really don't understand what this is about. Why is it so complicated? Explain it to me like I'm a child. And they would do that. And then a funny thing happened. People would start to feel comfortable to make mistakes. And once you're all doing that together, I think that's where creativity and play can form. So you can sit around and talk about ideas, where you'd like things to go and, and what you think you can do about them. So from there, I went to a, I went to the company we were trying to fight called FreeServe. And they had a consultancy come in called Logica at the time. They've changed their name now. And they said, these guys aren't product managers. They're business analysts. So I got retrained as a business analyst. Um, and I shouldn't overstate how um, big a deal that was. It wasn't that big a deal. We didn't get that much training. But they taught us very quickly about things like UML. I don't know if you guys have covered stuff like that. Universal modeling language. There were things around called rational rows. So to take you back to these days, for anyone that doesn't know, when we, as a product manager, you used to write business requirements. You were the you were the kind of liaison between the business and technology. And it was very much what the business wanted. It was about business needs and getting technology to deliver it. And the user didn't really exist in it all that much at the time. Um, the user was kind of, yeah, we're doing it for the user, but this is what the user wants. And there was a lot of arrogance in those days about what it, what it was that people thought businesses what users actually wanted from their services. I spent a lot of time in my early career um, doubting myself, questioning things, and being told I was ridiculous and stupid and I didn't know, I was just a young kid that didn't really know what he was doing. But over the years, a lot of the, that, those intuitive feelings I had about what was best for the customer ended up costing co organizations like that a lot of money. And over time, that really built my confidence. And it's something I've said to my students that I've just graduated over the last few months, is you know trust your gut if something seems ridiculous it probably is and there are existing models and business shapes for how things are done um, that people don't want to change because it's somebody's empire it's the way things have always been done that's a good phrase to look out for we've always done it that way that's usually when i start asking questions and saying well how might we do it differently okay now over this time as i say the emphasis in product management was very much on the business on business analysis, it was very much about writing stuff down and logging it, um, and it was still business needs. Uh, it's still that very much focused in that area, and there was also a lot of focus on you know the costs, the budgets, and stuff like that. And I realised over this time more and more that I, it was the user that I was still most interested in, and I was also fighting at the time for a more visual way of representing things. So we used to write what were called specification documents back in those days, and it would say the system shall, the system must. The system should, the system could, 
and kind of a you know Moscow sort of thing. If you've covered that, I'm sure um, Ashin's covered it, those sorts of things, um, or you can talk about them later. But it was very much a written thing, and it was very much a set of a feature list written in a spreadsheet that developers would then fight over whether or not they could or would deliver, um, and it would come back. And as I kind of charmingly put it, it looked like someone had bought a box of drop downs and chucked it at a wall and seen which one stuck, you know. So um, I was looking for a way of representing something more um, intuitively, more visually, um, that was less open to interpretation. Because nine times out of 10, I'd write these specs and we all would to the various product managers. And um, the, what came back was nothing like what we'd asked for or what we'd imagined. It was probably exactly what we'd asked for to the letter, but it wasn't exactly what we wanted. So around that time, I started um, arguing for this new tool that was on the market. I don't know if you've covered it called Axio RP, which I still use to this day. I get a lot of sticks from it uh, for it from uh, people from a graphic design background because it's not a drawing tool. It's part analysis tool, part UX tool, part project management tool, part flow charting, diagramming tool, prototyping. It does an awful lot of stuff. Um, most people that use it don't really know what it's capable of. You can generate a specification document from it. You can do use cases, conditional logics, uh, logic, different branch paths, depending on um, what you're what you're trying to achieve. So going on from there, I moved into what started become. I started hearing about this thing called information architecture, which seems to be more about that visual side of things. So I kind of basically took a big risk and went out there on the market, called myself a consultant, read a few books from Amazon and said, I know what this is. And I was on a lot of forums online talking to other people who are also trying to make their way into this area. And I remember being hired by someone at the time saying, do you know how thin on the ground you guys are? I could only find 69 of you in the country or some such like, you know, there weren't very many of us around. Um, so I had the fortunate opportunity really to be, I guess, one of the people that formed this kind of business in, 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 in a way, um, came up with the kind of patterns um, that are now commonplace. It's quite ironic now, actually, that it's quite hard trying to get a job on government projects here in the UK because they have this thing called GDS, their own government guidelines. And when I look at what that is, I've, I've looked it all up. It's, it's just all the common stuff, sense stuff that we all put together years ago, which someone's repackaged and sold to them as something that you have to know before you go in. Um, but it's really just, you know, the state of the market. So again, information architecture. Back in those days, there was a lot of there was a lot of work on taxonomies, how sites were organised, um, how you would um, organise faceted search, that sort of thing. All of which kind of got blown out of the water by um, Google and Big Search. You know, where you could just literally type what you wanted, and people expected to find it straight away. Um, so the focus started to shift away from that to a new emerging thing. And again, none of these things are immediately new, but they get mentioned at some point in the distant past and over time they slowly but surely become a thing and again I hopped into that kind of before it happened with all the people that were defining it and again that's quite a good strategy um, I might as well cover it while I'm here because I don't think I'll have a lot of time to backtrack so it's been a very useful strategy for me to pick the new thing that nobody else is doing yet and therefore be the longest person who's been doing it on the job market so I can't overemphasize how useful that's been for me. I'll talk a bit later about what those things are coming up, um, but that's been very, very useful from, from my point of view. So then I started calling myself a UXer. So as I said on the last page, it's kind of, you know, I've, I've branded myself all sorts of things depending on what was, what was fashionable, but I've largely been doing the same thing all of these years, working out what is it that people want that the business can, that technology can build, that the business can make money from. So I'm always looking for the win-win. Inexperienced UXs will always go out, will go out and they'll be very idealistic and they'll argue with the business and say, oh, but it should do this and it'd be nice if it did that. It's a very fast way to get yourself um, uh, put to one side, dismissed and ignored and be laughed at. You should really be aiming to know enough about the business and enough about technology enough about graphic design, enough about everybody else's area to be able to speak their language as well and speak re respectfully to it. Um, because nobody really wants a, a, a zealous uh, campaigner, which I have been back in the day, much to my you know, um, regret and, um, and not to the best outcomes. 
Um, I've gone in there saying he's got to be like that, though. You know, if you're not looking for that win win for everyone, you're probably asking for trouble. Um, so now increasingly, the kind of UX that I do, which is very full spectrum from start to finish, because I appreciate you may be aware now things have started to specialize more and more. They've broken it up into, oh, you're, are you a research UX or are you um, are you UI? Are you UX? Are you what are you? Which different area are you? Uh, I've when I started out, there was only one of you. You you were the only UXer in the village, and you did it all yourself. You probably didn't have enough resource. Um, you put ridiculous demands on yourself and stayed up half the night putting models together to show to people, and you thought that you should be able to do it on your own. We've realised over time that it's actually a much bigger job, and that's been a great relief to me over time. So career path, as I say, are these these areas here plus. If it would come to life, what's going on here? Sorry, that's not happening. Right, via a completely unrelated field. So it's important there, you know, um, Ashin pointed out the guitar. Yeah, I used to work in a totally different field. I started off as a local radio, radio disc jockey. Um, I walked in at lunchtime I, when I was 16 in my school uniform uh, with a tape I'd made on a twin deck and asked them if I could, you know, if they had any work going. And they gave me a job. They said, can you come in Saturday? The guy gave me five minutes lesson on the desk and, and left me to it. Said he hadn't cut me a key yet. And um, I said, what, you, are you going to leave me here? He said, yeah, you want to you learn to drive, go into the city centre. And off he went. He said, if there's a fire, put a chair through the front window. I haven't cut you a key, key yet. So I started out probably at 16 or, or so in a very, you know, having to just make, you know, make it work go in not necessarily knowing everything but challenge myself and i think you'll find the more that you do that over the years um the more confident you will be i look at every new product net project now and i say that looks impossible i can't do that we all have that nervous little voice in our head that says that and then i relax and i say you've been here before and every other time you've made it work you're going to make it work this time so allow yourself to build that confidence um and and you know, don't be afraid of challenging yourself. In fact, that's the way that you'll push yourself ahead. Another way of getting forward, I suppose, is I've kept pushing myself up. For, I haven't waited to be ready for the jobs before I've put myself forward for them. I've said, I'll, I'll take, I've, I've accepted the job first and then worked out how I'm going to do it very fast and often at my in my own time um, later on. So I'm not saying just go in and blag. I'm saying go in and say, this is what I... I, yeah, I can do that, but then make sure you do, which might mean ordering a load of books that you haven't had before, uh, you haven't read about before, learn how to do it. You might have to stay up all night doing it a few nights in the first couple of weeks. But the only really, really brilliant way, proper way of learning stuff is to actually do it and apply yourself. Um, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but you can read all the books in the world. You'll always feel like there's one more book that you should know, you should you should read. Or one more thing you should understand before you're ready to move to the next step. The only thing that makes you ready for the next step is doing the next step. So I'd very much encourage you to um, to just push yourselves if you've got it in you. Um, is this going to move? For some reason not, my mouse isn't moving forward to the next pages. OK, so people always welcome UX with open arms, right? I don't know if you've got any guesses on that. You can maybe just take a moment there to answer between yourselves. Ashin, is your voice still live? Can you see the chat? Is anyone? It, it sure is. Well, what, do you, what do you think, folks? So UX designers, UX people, welcomed with open arms all the time? Yes or no? What's the verdict? Nope. We've got one nope in the <laughs> arena. we got no, 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 no. It's not always true, lol. <laughs> there you Fantastic. go. As you, you got the right answer. <laughs> no. OK, um, that is not the case. That not the case at all. I mean, it's becoming easier. But I went when I went in there to, to start with nine times out of 10, I wouldn't last very long because you're going in there up against people who have got existing empires that have never been questioned. And you're going in and saying, you know, you should really be more honest to people about what it is you're selling. And you've got this, the head of sales saying, who is this kid? My sales are going to go down. I've got targets to meet. I'm going to lose my bonus, blah, 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 blah. You've also, you're kind of the grease between the wheel, between wheels across the whole organization. And that function never really existed before. Everyone had their own little silos that they ran by themselves. And the CEO had a kind of, you know, monthly or weekly meeting with them. 
Uh, but everyone kind of did their own thing. Suddenly you're coming in, probably a lot younger than all of those people. Um, and again, that's changing. I mean, I started this back in the mid 90s, you know, um, and, and the late 90s when I was kind of moving into this and kind of the early 2000s, probably going into AOL and product management. Um, so you're going in and challenging the status quo, threatening people's authority, threatening their positions. And you had a lot of people kind of saying, we're going to clip this guy's wings. And so you can build enemies for very quickly. So I really had to learn how to convey my message in better ways. So I, I'd like to come up, I like to come up with things that I call golden sentences, which I, I inherited for, from another great consultant, um, which is just a really nice, concise, tight way of saying something that you could spend 15 minutes blathering on about, but you can say really, really neatly. An example might be, there's no point in going 100 miles an hour if you're going in the wrong direction. Neat little nuggets like that. So instead of saying, yeah, yeah, but if we do that and we're not thinking about it, but you don't have that much of people's time and attention. In fact, something I tell all of my clients is you have far less of your users' time and attention than you think you do. And another favorite of mine that I often stick on a poster on the wall during workshops is too many messages equals no message. So if you try and talk to people, if you try and say everything, people aren't, they glaze over, they get bored. I'll leave those with you. So how do you combat, combat this in a business? Well, I found, and this is still true to an extent, nobody really knows what UX is. Nobody's got a full definition of it. I know I was running a course trying to codify it and you're on a course where you're trying to codify it then and, and this is still happening it's still an evolving thing um but there is no single process that works everywhere there's no right completely right answer in all cases so you really have to go out there and kind of have a toolbox of stuff and try the different things and be flexible and adaptable to find what does and doesn't work okay so how how do I do this I run a brown bag session. If you don't know what that is, it's an American term. Um, in American schools, you would get your lunch in a, in a, bring it in a brown bag. You've got your packed lunch. So it's basically, it's free work for your company where people sit around at lunchtime and somebody gives a talk. So, uh, they've become all sorts of different things. You could use it for a bit of training to share information. You could argue that this stuff should happen in business time. I was a bit of an ex-socialist like um, other people around. I, I would argue this should happen in business hours, but, you know, it doesn't always. If you want to do something that you can't get time for in the um, in the uh, from from the business, a great thing to do is invite people along at lunchtime and say, you know, OK, this is what this thing's about. Um, there's a great, great guy called Matt Wilkinson. I saw speak in London that used to do photography and he said, um, he said that he likened the wireframe in UX um, very much to his other hobby of photography. And you liken the wireframe to being like the moment when he pressed the shutter on the camera, pressed the button. Um, and people think, oh, well, the picture is just, you know, you take the picture, you take a snap of what's in the frame. But people forget that to get to that great moment, you've had to go out and you've, you've chosen your subject, You've chosen your location, you've chosen the time of day, you've had to organize your lighting, you've used your scopes. There's an awful lot of stuff that happens before you take that picture. And I would walk into companies all the time and still do to an extent, and people are kind of going, where's my wireframe? You know, which is really soul destroying because you're trying to explain there's a lot more happens before that. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Jesse James Garrett's Elements of User Experience. That's this book here. Um, there's a second edition. I've, I, I've never read it. Uh, the first one can get me enough. To be honest, I don't think I even read the whole the whole of this first one. I never have time. I've been too busy working all my life and I will go in and read what I need to as I need to. But I just read this first part and what I could see in here was a structure within which I could see every other product development lifecycle process that I'd come across over the years. Now, all of these different processes that people kind of sell as being the tr the ultimate truth they are all if you trace them back they're all just some consultancy's branded version of common sense with their own terms that they've slapped on it in order to be able to tra trademark it and sell it to everyone else but at the end of the day it always comes down to these various things now i've got a full presentation on this 
um, which we really unfortunately don't have time to cover. It kind of take an hour in itself. I'm a little hesitant. I'm going to try. No, that hasn't worked. Um, I, that was meant to be a link. Oh, here we go. It is working. OK, so I've got this. Isn't it just about the wireframes? Oshin, how well is my screen tracking if I flick down through this? Is it fast enough to keep up if I scroll down through it? It's perfect. OK, great. So what I do is I take that structure and I say to people, here you go. This is, and don't worry about catching all the detail. I go, right, at strategy level, what is this product? So I give them a vision statement. Who's it for? What is their need? What's it called? How does it differ from other things? What's its unique selling point? There's an elevator pitch exercise you can use. Um, from there, I talk about different ways of gathering information. I can go top down. I can say, right, we're spec savers and we do all these and we have an online and an offline area. And under onla online, we do glasses and we do contact lenses. So that's top down feature um, elicitation, if you like, or breakdowns. You can also do it bottom up. You can just throw stuff at the wall and then work out how you put it into a structure later. Um, anything missing? You know, our goal is to ship a million units this quarter. Do we have any goals that involve making customers happy? I'm talking about our goals, not their goals, totally different. So what's missing from that is the user. So I do various things over the years in terms of strategy, research analysis with data. So this is the Benicol website. I looked at them and I looked at of all the information of all the pages that they had, people were only using a small number of those pages. And I kind of went, you know, really, you could dump most of the effort on most of this site and still please most of the people. You can use tracking tools on websites to see where people are clicking, get click heat maps. You can do use search with, research with users. You can put together with users work out personas. Um, you can go out on the street, as I did in South Africa here, and do walk up interviews to people. Uh, I can affinity map all that. That takes time. I can do work with the customers to put together. Um, this is co-creation with customers, more co-creation. This is one-to-one -one interviews with users working out in South Africa for Nedbank. Um, how do families relate to other people? This was a service to, um, in financially. This was a service design piece looking for other ways that the business that um, that Nedbank was going to be able to offer new kinds of experiences and services to their customers. Um, I'm going to again flick through very quickly again with internal users. What do we think the first page of this um, of this app should look like? And can we then dot vote it, put them up on a wall for a while, worked out which one we pursued that way? Um, more co-creation with customers. This is service design, um, Air Berlin and Excelia. What services can we build that you'll pay for that customers want? All that sort of thing. This is me doing breaking down stories for spec savers, four different walls worth of information. I, I begged them to let me do one. They said that wouldn't be enough. When we broke down each of those main key areas, we got months and months of work. The next time they let me, let me do two, and the time after that they started trusting me and we did one at every workshop. You're then gathering um, here, gathering user needs. I won't go into the detail. Using experience maps to work out how people travel through a site and what their tasks are. Process maps to work out what people do. User stories prioritized by user. And only at that stage are we getting to scope. If you get my drift, this is what I'm trying to get through to companies. When you go to a digital agency or you speak to people from a graphic design background, they tend to start up at that surface level. And really, unless you're building things one step at a time from the ground up on each of these foundations, you're going to end up with something messy that doesn't necessarily do what it needs to do. So in this case, I'm reprioritizing in scope. What do we do? So we've gone, what might we do? Now we're going to how much of it should we do? And then I'm looking at these things. What are the dependencies? As I go along, I'm looking at all these things that the company wants, these top 15. But I'm saying they're all dependent on a number of things that they don't have that they need so often the client part of your job is to say no and to push back and save them from themselves which is hard as well and may get you fired you need to say i know you want all this sexy stuff but you can't have it until you've built a foundation where you've got a login to a data store where we can get shared information i can't give you persistent accounts i can't track your progress through a competition if i don't know who you are so at this stage we're getting to structure and you'll notice these get shorter as you go along at structure, then we're talking about this block level stuff. How do things relate to each other? What are the main sections of the site? And what is the general, what are the pieces of, or the chunks of content on each of those, in each of those sections? 
that helps you put together a structure. How do pages flow together? This is for Calpol, the children's um, the children's medicine. We took that from here are our products to what do you need from our products? So instead of saying here's a bunch of products, choose one, we said how old is your child? What's wrong with your child? Or which product do you want? And that's what's being represented here. So it was changing the way that we looked at stuff. Um, while I'm on the subject, I don't know why it, it's not directly relevant, but I remember saying a lot during this this particular project that whilst advertising used to be very much about push. So you would go, here's our products. Now it's all about pull and that's where UX is. You need to encourage people to come in by saying why because you've got so many channels and so much medium now. You really need to say people are saying, why should I care? So you start by identifying how you can help them, which is why everything's becoming more service oriented, which is now why, why service design is becoming such a big thing. Um, so at this stage, structure also includes sitemaps. This is Guinness.com. Um, I like to do just a quick tip. I like to do my sitemaps like this because I can get them onto a piece of A3. When you try and do something hierarchically, hierarchically, um, you'll find that you run out of horizontal space very, very quickly. So you've got the same thing here. You've actually got the center, but each of these sections is stuff that's coming off of it. It means I can make a an A3 printout of a um, of a site and get it on a wall where everyone can look at it and see it all at once without having to sticky tape together an awful lot of um, of A4 or A3 sheets. Um, the tool I'm using for this, if you're interested, is called Omnigraffle. Um, I don't use it for much else other than this nowadays. And if you search, there's a fantastic tool out there. I'll give you one of my big secrets here. Um, there is a little script that I found that will search the robot.txt of a website and generate a basic version of the website for you in Omnigraffle, which you can then rearrange in a pretty way. Now I usually use this. I'll I take while I'm doing a bunch of this, the less sexy stuff that the client doesn't want me to do. I will go home, generate one of these, make it neat and then spend three days doing stuff that needs to be done that he doesn't care about. And then I'll come back and tell him I did this and he'll be delighted. So sometimes sneaking and finding a way of getting the time you need to do the stuff to get yourself properly situated and organized to do a project can be important. So at this stage, we're at Skeleton. Now, this is often where your digital agencies and creative agencies will start. And whether you start here or up here will differentiate what kind of a UX or design or UCD person you are. Um, at best, the agencies tend to start at the surface or the skeleton, and they might go to structure, but they tend to do it after they've already done the skeleton and the surface. So. This is make structure complete, concrete, what components would enable people to use the site. So I use design objectives. I spent two years with an agile consultancy, was dragged kicking and screaming into agile, believing that it was the antithesis of, um, of, of creativity. Um, but I learned to use it for me. You're not meant to be able to see the detail here, but what I had was two main user stories saying a product listings page and a product details page. And I had design goals or objectives under that in a prioritized order, which I'd got the client to agree to. So I knew what it was I was trying to design and it was measurable when we got out the other side. Um, you might have heard of OKRs. There's a lot of talk of them these days and it's kind of, you know, objectives and then the key result you're expecting from it. What is it you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to you want to be able to measure whether or not you've achieved what you set out to. So in the case of a product listings page, I, I might say I want to be able to see a lot of glasses nice and clearly. I want to be able to filter them. I want to see a nice big picture. I want to be able to rotate it. So that's what I took into a two week sprint. And then I produced this here, um, which is my wireframe interactive prototype version of glasses. There was some neat stuff I put in here, which everyone fought me on at the time. These are 320 wide, each of these um, columns. And I did that because mobile was a new thing. Again, they fought me on that. Oh, mobile's not that big a deal. Nobody buys anything on mobile. But I fought for it and fought for it. I shared a drink with the, the account manager a couple of years ago and he reminded me of this. And I said, oh, yeah, nobody wanted to do that. Back when I started, this stuff was these columns were half the size. Um, the, by doing it like this, I was able to take this design and then map it straight over to iOS at 320 pixels and then drop this filter menu in from the top without redesigning it so I could repurpose stuff. So if you start to get a reputation for being able to um, both help technology with a componentized build and help the business with making money and saving money and getting more quickly or better value and um, do stuff that kind of understand 
how tech builds stuff and how graphic design need to work um, and put a little help and tips in for all those people. You'll make a lot of friends. And then when you mess up, you might find there's people there to help catch you. So I do a lot of that. These are some mobile versions of the same pages and only then are we up to surface. I've got some examples here. So this was the original product listings page for Specsavers, spindly little box of glasses. Um, I turned it into this and this is the final graphic design with the um, paint job on. And as a final example of that, this is a home page I came to. This is my wireframe and that's the final graphic design. So there was an awful lot of talk. There was an awful lot of fighting to be done to get all that stuff off that home page because, you know, somebody at every board meeting for like 10 years or probably 30 has gone in and said oh i need this on the home page i need that on the home page you might remember earlier i said too many messages equals no message well that's exactly what this is you know tell me where to click i've actually got a great photo of the spec savers um boss or head of marketing where i i basically i wrote out every element on his home page on a separate card and stuck it on a wall and I gave him a task of organizing what was the most important. And I left him there for 15 minutes, knowing full well that he was going to fail miserably. And he was scratching his head. He was panting and puffing. He was sweating. <coughs> and I said, finding it a bit difficult. And he said, yeah. I said, that's because there's too much stuff there, right? So that was how I kind of conveyed over to him that probably we need to rationalize what's here. So we can see it's going on over here. As I've said, OK, so you sell your main key areas people are interested in are in our chemicals, energy, fertilizers. Let's put the top 10 in a box here. Let's give a bit about who are we? And we let people find what they were looking for in a clearer way. I do a bit of comedy at the end here. Um, dynamic environment, our leadership keeps changing priorities. I'll share this with you guys another time. But from there, I'm going to go back to presentation. So that's how I go in and kind of sell things. Um, keeping up. I got a few questions in, guide questions from Ashin on how we might do these things. Um, so the question is, in fact, I'm missing a page. There is a page missing here. It'll probably come up later. So the question is, how do you keep up? And, the, and my answer to that was, um, really, I don't, and no one really can sustainably. There is so much to know and so much to learn and so many different areas. Um, really, I get a lot of books on Kindle. I've got them all on my iPad. If something comes up that I don't know, I run off to the toilet and read about it or I go home and I study it all night and I make sure I know it by the morning. Um, I, there was a time when I put a lot of pressure on myself to know everything at all times. I found it wasn't really sustainable or useful, wasn't the best use of my time and it was hard to have a life as well. So things you can do are newsletters, like so subscribing to things, creative block, for example, I've, I've got, I, I'm not highly recommending it, but they come up and talk about what people are doing with logos or what people are doing with branding, that sort of thing. LinkedIn articles I'll read that other people have written. I'll ask other people. I'll ask my children, you know, my kids, the 20 and 16. What are you guys into? They were laughing at me recently because I didn't know about TikTok. And, and so I now I'm on TikTok. You've got to keep yourself current and relevant. But going over there, keeping an eye on what other people are talking about like that. I'm starting to hear people joking about Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter being a bit old hat and the kids are now all on um, on on TikTok. You need to keep an eye on that. I've just been telling clients today because they basically they, they were I'm designing something today for this kind of augmented reality platform um, and they're going oh just base it on uh, base it on what Instagram do on this or that and say okay we got to look a bit further ahead of that. See so what you want to you want to design for what's coming. This is a good moment to talk about um, one of the things I say to agencies. Agencies talk a lot about best practice. I kind of call it BS practice because it's in reality what what best practice means is selling somebody yesterday's solution to somebody else's problem. And if you're really applying yourself to a problem correctly, you should be trying to build tomorrow's solution to tomorrow's problem. You know, looking at each problem uniquely and saying, what is it that I can do? Or what what should I be aiming for in order to make sure that I can um, I can build a solution that is scalable um, that will will last that is not future proof there's no such thing but that is likely to still have a chance next year and you know has placed some respect to what's coming anticipating new versions of old patterns is a useful way of doing things here so I'll look for analogs how do things work in the real world and how could we apply digital solutions to that 
um, or what's happened before. I remember there's an article I put in the Guardian where I got laughed at for saying that mobile was going to be the next big, big thing. I think it was back in 2009. And um, I said, yeah, it's really going to change. What, what, I changed, what I noticed was I'd just seen somebody launching a, 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 a fixed price data package, an unlimited, you know, you could buy a mobile phone with an unlimited data package. Now, I remember when that happened with broadband, everyone started using their computers more. When you didn't have to dial up and there wasn't a cost to every time that you came on, you could, um, everyone just started using it for looking up phone numbers. They stayed online all the time. The usage shot up. And I, once I saw that coming in with mobile, I thought that this is what's going to make it kick off. People said, no, people have been saying that for years. Nothing's going to change. It'll be boring again. Now, if you go back and do a hockey, do a, do a, a search on uptake of smartphones and smartphone and mobile data usage since then, it goes up with a hockey stick. And all I did there was look at what is similar about what's coming to what's happened before. UX is all about patterns, finding, identifying them, finding the problem at the high level and applying onto what's coming next. So I'm working on a platform now, I can't talk about it too much, but we're gonna be doing kind of live broadcasts, but using, um, maybe better augmented reality versions of yourself. So how would we do comms? What's important about how we communicate that video can't do that a more virtual presence could do? So I'm looking at, I'm constantly stealing from the past and repurposing it for the future. That's your best friend that you've got. So keeping up is not as important as knowing where to look for the right answers, having the right mindset and being able to look creatively at what might be coming and be prepared for that. Don't try and keep up with everything. Do try and keep up with what might be useful. Most of all, read on demand. So I've already covered that. It's important that you should pick something that you're interested in. So, you know, I've kind of got an interest in the whole VR thing. I'd been looking at, um, at uh, Oculus Quest. I thought that was fabulous. I had bought myself a green screen. Um, I started working with that. This is all gonna be used in the job that I'm working with. I started taking an interest myself in different technologies. I'll cover those in a minute. Just keep an eye on the time. I'm kind of eating into my Q&A time. Oshin, do you want me to kind of finish off with the short bit I've got? How much time do we need for Q&A? Uh, you, you keep going, man. This is fantastic. Absolutely okay. brilliant. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, so any experience of blockchain? I'm going to cover these very quickly. I worked on a blockchain project, um, a marine blockchain project with Microsoft, half the UK insurance industry, EY, whole bunch of people. Did about 10, 15 days, built a great little um, prototype. Apparently it's gone on to win an award. Nobody told me, I worked on it for 15 days. And as is often the case, you don't always get to keep your babies in UX. You work on these things, you put your heart and soul in. Uh, and then we presented it to all these big wigs in the UK. Um, and they, um, they went out and uh, they said, okay, yeah, we've got to think about it for three months or we're going to go away and talk about it. Now, of course, the agency I was working for doesn't want to keep me on on a uh, retainer for three months while they work that out. So I rolled off of it. I have worked for that company again a few times. So next time I was working for them, they said, oh, yeah, that blockchain thing you worked on. That, uh, yeah, won an award, I think. I'm like, great, thanks for telling me, guys. Um, I did work on it. But speaking more broadly than that, blockchain, that is big business trying to get in on blockchain. There's a lot of small, smaller people trying to find a, a position in that. It is really, really hot all over Silicon Roundabout, which is the kind of London version of Silicon Valley down in Old Street. Um, they're having meetups every day. Um, there's blockchain groups. Lots of people are trying to, build, trying to build on it, but they're all startups fighting amongst themselves for what they should and shouldn't do. Um, and and what, what's going to be the, the first big real thing that takes advantage of it. Nobody's really won that yet. I haven't kind of been paying as, that close attention to it, but it is happening. It is interesting. It does, sorry, it democratizes that whole business um, very much. Um, business for good, um, I was asked about. This sort of thing is 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 turning up. I did a project for a, a um, charity organization run by uh, Nadia Vodya, Natalia Vodianova, Russian supermodel. She has a thing, an organization called Na Naked Hearts. And she, she had this thing where she saw the like button on Facebook and she didn't think that she thought that was really boring. There should be a love button. So she ended up doing this thing, which is now called LB, which as far as I can see is very much self-funded. Um, but I suppose my point to make here is I've got a lot of students that were coming up to me during um, 
study recently, especially the way the world's going and new interests. People saying, I want to work for good. I want to work for good stuff. When you're forming a career, you don't necessarily have as much chance as you'd like. You can make it. You can try and be as you can try and um, you, you can try and be a force for good within organizations, but they're not they're not all out for good. And I will even tell you the charities can be some of the most ruthless, most ruthless people to work with out there. Um, so it's not as nicey nicey, even if you do get in with the good guys. Now, that said, an ex colleague from a, a consultancy called Hiveworks, which was part of Orange and now is separate, um, reached out to me recently and she's formed a business and she only wants to work on business for good projects. And she asked me, would I be happy to go and, and, and work with her on them? I said, sure, we booked two days work with me facilitating some workshops to help uh, develop a roadmap. Um, I said, great, uh, but then, you know, the work fell through. So that work is out there, it's coming, there's an appetite for it, but it hasn't yet had its moment. And it's probably not yet as robust a place to be building a career, sorry, as um, as is the traditional private sector, which I won't lie to you, can be horrible. It's been lovely teaching people for the last four months, but now I'm back uh, fighting deadlines and doing stuff because there's investors saying, can we have this? And they're putting money into the business. Business for good, I love the idea and I would love to be doing more of it, but it's there's not as much of it as I'd like. Um, B Corps, same sort of thing, really that, that second part, Business for Good was really my intention was to talk about the charities and the B Corps is really my friend Marie Jeunesse organization trying to kind of um, do good and only work on valuable projects. But I know, or, or, or projects with social value, but I know she's struggling to find work in a way that she wouldn't be if she were working in the traditional sector. And that's a choice. And if you can afford to do that, more power to you. I, I can't personally, got two kids, got mortgage, all that sort of thing. So I strive towards that kind of thing, but um, I wouldn't hang my hat on it as a, an absolute guarantee for the time being. But I was at WeWork, everything was very different there. I think things are changing. We'll cover some more of that in a minute. Um, so finally, challenges and opportunities. What's coming up? So Brexit's and changing tax laws. Tax laws. Now I know you guys are from all over the place, but that's why I've put the, the BR in brackets. Everyone else started talking about exits as well. Um, changing tax laws can hit anywhere. Stuff that's changed for me over the last few years is I found it very hard getting work a lot of last year into this year, um, apart from that four or five months of teaching that I was doing. Um, because Brexit was coming, there was a lot of unpredictability. People weren't hiring. Just when that sort of got settled and we said, yeah, we're getting out, um, the there was a change to tax laws coming, change to something called IR35. Businesses have been using um, consultants and independent contractors as uh, glorified temps for a long time, not understanding that you're a third party service provider that is meant to work under your own supervision, direction and control. Um, and when you're not doing that, um, basically the government considers that you may be taking advantage of tax breaks that you shouldn't otherwise get. This put a big hole in hiring for the last while in my business. Now, as a result of the recent pandemic, They've decided to delay these changes for a year and instantly I've been getting more and more requests for work again. So hopefully by the time next year comes around, they'll have thought about it a bit better. So whilst these things are challenges, they can also be opportunities. So if you can work out how you can solve those problems for these companies, maybe you've got a chance. So what I did was got involved with some other consultants I knew and we formed because these guys were going after one man bands that were, pretend, were basically disguised employees. There's a load of stuff you're meant to be able to do if you're a proper consultancy. Um, so what I can do now is I can I've got the right of substitution. I can send someone else in to replace me if they're with the client's permission, if they've got the right skill set. Um, I my only client isn't this um, particular customer. So that makes things safer for them. It also means potentially instead of me being as as I'm not a one man band anymore, the jobs I'm going up for, I'm going up against actual agencies who build people like me out for instead of say 500 pounds a day, like I might myself, would build, myself, build me out at 1,000 to 1,500 pounds a day. So I found with the last few things I've been, I've been pitching for, I'm able to put myself in at 850 and still be com competitive. As a day rate, that's pretty good. Um, I haven't seen it yet. And on this occasion, under the circumstances, the role I've taken right now, I've done what I'm gonna tell you to do as well. Take anything. 
I, I advised a student on this recently. She had a job come up and she's like, but the money's a bit low. And I said, well, do you need the money? And she said, well, no, I've got work from my previous, I've got money from my previous career. And I said, well, sounds to me like you need the experience more than you need the money. And with me, this opportunity I've taken right now, it's way below my normal day rate, but it gets me into augmented reality. Two things I really wanted to get involved with, we'll talk about in a moment. But these, the, the, the point is, with every kind of challenge, can come a, an opportunity if you look at it the right way. So lockdowns, this is very challenging. Um, this has meant a lot of people can't go to work, but it also means a lot of people are now looking for people who can work at home. And investors are looking for companies that can continue to operate even if you're even if the workforce is still at home. So that means even in the middle of this, we lost some investment on this project I was on from a very big well-known investor last week, but this week we gained another one. Because whilst that one company was that first company was risk averse, the second one went, well, these guys are still doing business. And they've hired me during that this lockdown and these circumstances, and we're still operating pretty effectively. So finally, leading into new technologies, new technologies, obviously, um, new technologies are what we're doing right now. We're talking about virtual presence in a way or using kind of a virtual hologram of ourselves that we can transmit into your room. That eventually, you'll be able to look at through a pair of VR glasses. Um, that's a, that's a fascinating new thing. That's very exciting to people during a lockdown at the moment. Yeah, because everyone's going, how do we have meetings properly? I can't see people's body language. How do I improve this? So again, there's these three are all related. You know, there's there's an opportunity for new technology um, to do things. Fi the final two things I wanted to talk about. I was looking at AR and um, voice input as the two things I wanted to get to. If you think back to earlier in this presentation, the first thing I said was I've always tried to get into the, involved with the thing first that nobody else is doing yet, and to be the uh, and to be the best at it first. And if I can't be the best, I'm at least going to be the guy who's been doing it longest. So my CV will always say. Yeah, Goldman's been doing this since year X, when everyone else just started doing it five minutes ago. That's a big advantage in getting your CV seen in the first place. Um, I was interested in voice control, things like Alexa, Google, Google um, Home. She, she's just started responding now uh, because I've said her name. But I've, I was going to start. How do I start designing for that? How do I get involved in that? And the other one was AR is the thing to get into. Now, AR has come up. I've had to take a massive hit on wage to take it, but I'm delighted that I did. Any questions? Uh, amazing. First, a round of applause. Wow, that was just superb. Absolutely superb. A lot of great information there. Um, folks, th yes, we're seeing some claps in the uh, in the chat window now. Um, I'm going to try and find my way back to, I, I, I'm going to stop presenting so I can okay. see the video again. Fantastic. Ah, oh, there you are. Great. OK, we have a, a bit of time for questions, folks. Get them in quickly. <laughs> There you go. That really was great. That was so cool. Thank you. First question, who's going to step forward? Unmute yourself. OK, we have good feedback. That was wonderful. That was great. Many clapping emojis. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. That's Do we good. have any questions? Can I see the chat and the video at the same time? That's OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Where do I do that? Yeah, I can see the chat. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and I can see your video. Brilliant. Good stuff. Any questions, okay. anyone? Anyone want to cover stuff? Uh, any, anything I didn't cover you wanted to know about? It's a limited. Hi. Amount. Hello. Who's that? <laughs> it's, it's me again. <laughs> so thinking about opportunities right now. Um, so being from the education sector, I'm seeing a lot of opportunities in that I was a strong advocate of having a robust online experience. And I mean, advocating that for years. And now I think it's kind of forcing colleges and universities to revisit that in a very serious way. Has to the online experience is not what it's like, and you have to make it much more mature, much more interesting. How do you see that kind of industry going? I'm glad you brought that up because it's one of the things I, I meant to mention, but I didn't. This is one of the opportunities this lockdown is showing us that whereas people have often um, looked at working at home as a kind of a, a sub um, a sub idea a less than ideal option actually it works a lot better for people's lives it can save people's uh, it can save companies desk time and i think it's going to force this whole change in, in everyone being stuck at home it's going to force people to realize that actually this stuff can work remotely and that is you know that, that's um you know that's really 
how, how can we make better use of this stuff in the future? Very good, brilliant question. Uh, thank you, Lorena. Um, it's eight o'clock. Do we have time for one more question? Going once, going twice. People are asking, was it recorded? People are saying this is brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, so I don't think we have any more questions. Go and thank you so much, man. That was just a brilliant deep dive, a very inspiring uh, maverick queer path and some real, you know, some real talk there, some real talk about what it what it takes to be a UX designer. So just absolutely fantastic. I can't thank you enough, man. Um, so folks, we're going to wrap it up there. Join me in thanking Goldman. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we are going to reconvene in one week here uh, for our final class next week, which is on April the 22nd. So um, I'll send you all some uh, an assignment using Teams. And uh, until next week, have a great, great, great week. And thank you again, again Goldman. Great to see you, man. Thank you and good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you, thank you.